Namibia, uh, Formosa Institute, and also my first time in uh, Taipei. Uh, it's a very interesting experience because this country is not like, uh, frankly speaking, I have been to many countries so far. Taiwan is different, and it's a learning process. I have met many people. Of course, it is not possible to analyze a country based on a two or three days visit, but uh, even such a long, such a short visit, I think gives me, um, the, I can say that, uh, I mean, it's, it's very apparent that, the, that there are very sharp intellectuals, very strong academia, and very tolerant society. But unfortunately, today, despite this uh, fantastic introduction, I will talk about a little bit boring things, but at the end, I will try my best to give some kind of, you know, uh, optimistic you know, suggestions about what the international community, including Taiwan, people in Taiwan can do, can contribute to this uh, problem of radicalism. It is a fact. Uh, I'm a scholar focusing on state-society relations in the Middle East. So I have been uh, in this area for almost uh, 20 years, 18 years. I had the opportunity of uh, making or living in various parts of the Middle East, Syria, Iran, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, uh, North Africa, Egypt, uh, Yemen, for example, the Gulf. Uh, so as a, as a scholar who is trying to analyze the things from a scholarly perspective, but on the other hand as a Muslim, uh, I think we should first diagnose the problem. We have a radicalism problem. This is more apparent in the Middle East, but not something happening only in this region. In different ways, there is a trend of extremism even in Western Europe in terms of rise of uh, center-right parties. But let me first clarify why we have this problem in a more uh, systematic perspective. First of all, religion is a process of interpretation. So, in simple ways, religion cannot speak. Religion, religi religious texts, be, they, be it Quran or Bible or Torah, need someone to speak on behalf of itself. So. Uh, we, as we call in Islam, Quran does not speak. So some people interpret Quran in a way. The first thing we should know about radicalism is there are some interpretations of religious texts, including Quran, unfortunately, in a very radical, extreme way. But please be noted that it is not the only interpretation we have. There are different interpretations of Islam. Uh, most of them are moderate, you know, peaceful. And in fact, Islam has its own historical background uh, to approve itself as a peaceful religion. In other ways, Islam was not devised in the last decade in Iraq, <coughs> Iraq or in northern Syria. Islam is a religion of centuries, which uh, goes back to 7th century, and full of historical positive experiences and samples that approve itself as a religion of tolerance. But right now, the first thing we should know about why we have radicalism is interpretation. Interpreting holy books, so books are speaking, through those radical tones which bring their societies to a chaotic situation. But here's the question, the second question then. Why we have this kind of interpretations? It's mainly about the quality of people, poverty and education. In the beginning, I did tell about my personal experience of being spending some time in many countries. Let me give you some personal anecdotes. Once, part of a project, I spent some time in Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan. Imagine a society living in a state of war for more than 40, 40 years. It means that all institutions of culture and education failed. In Taiwan, any, any clever person who told so far, tell me the history of Taiwan, bringing the best brains from mainland, sophisticated people. That, and I'm convinced that in a sense, the success of Taiwan based on those sophisticated people came from mainland, 50 or 40 years ago. So quality of people in that sense, I'm not talking about racial or cultural quality, but uh, professional quality, educational quality, is critical. But imagine Afghanistan now has no such a quality in that professional quality because Afghanistan is a country uh, living in a kind of state of war for more than 40 years. Before going to Afghanistan, let me give another striking sample to understand the case on the ground. I had a kind of intensive course. What to do, how to do in Afghanistan, because it's a different country. Even though I'm Muslim, it's a chaotic country, then you need a certain kind of guidance. 
It's typical. There are home pages even about Taiwan, Turkey, what to do in Taiwan. For example, in some countries, you should ask how is your wife. In some countries, you should ask how is your wife. It's kind of stuff. Or in America, for example, there are some certain things you shouldn't do. Uh, for instance, in Turkey, if you see a kind of small kid, it's part of culture. Hey, kid, how are you? What is time? You know, you can kiss the kid, but in US, you shouldn't do that. So these are cultural differences. <laughs> then we have a kind of it's working, kind of uh, program, very intense program of Afghanistan. So many things you were told, but one thing was interesting to understand radicalism. The guy, uh, he was a kind of security guy focusing on Afghanistan, told me that you should be careful because if you have any psychological problem, because you will see many people amputated hands and legs, amputated. Frankly speaking, I couldn't realize why, why, why they are warning us about amputated things. Amputated, amputated is a couple of hands. It's called amputated. I mean, no hands, no legs. Then one, I, I arrived in Kabul and spent a couple of time in Kabul and then moved to northern Afghanistan, Mazar Sharif. I have seen so many people amputated. So this is a society, people lost their, some parts of their bodies because of war, mines, and so on. This is, so we should understand it. The, the, the state of art on the ground. This may, uh, this may force people towards radicalization. Imagine the psychology of those people. Then to understand <coughs> how come ISIS like groups easily recruit people. I mean, they are recruiting. There is a kind of social basis towards that in such societies. I mean, I'm sad to say say this. I'm sad to explain this, but this is a sociological fact. We have millions and millions, and sometimes more than even people who are going through an intensive warfare, lacking basic needs, and have no alternative to substitute or continue the life. So this is the second point. The third point part of that, to explain the sociological setting that gives radicalism opportunity is, part, again, just like very much to Afghanistan, is the collapse of social order. Just imagine the Middle Eastern map. Iraq is collapsing, OK? Syria. Libya, Yemen, uh, not only Middle East, look at North, Georgia. Russia is, you know, de facto uh, supporting a group of, a part of Georgia against central government. Or Ukraine, for example. I mean, Ukraine, at least in northwest part east of Ukraine, because of crime issue, is in a kind of decay. A couple of weeks ago, I read a detailed report on Ukraine in Newsweek magazine, this information magazine, and it is typical what happened in Afghanistan. People now facing tremendous economic problems are becoming, you know, somehow close to radical interpretation. Why is this important? For two reasons. One is, in, radical, in, in collapsing societies, order <coughs> collapse, for instance, in Turkey right now, we have almost, it's not, the number is not clear, but something between 1.5 to 2 million Syrian refugees. Okay? Well, what is the meaning of that? I mean, millions of people living in their society. Imagine a Syrian girl who is 8 years old or 9 years old, left his home and spent 3 years in the camp, then 2 years in all of camp. Then who is she? You happen to born in a society, for example here, you become Chinese, you go to school, you learn Chinese, okay? Then you are part of Chinese culture. Culture helps you, culture protects you, culture trains you, tame you. The radical aspect of your human nature is tamed by your culture because we have a respect. So you don't want to be seen something unwanted by your culture, okay? It's a modesty that we learn from our culture. But millions of people spending time in camps out of camps, because they are out of their cultural context, they are no longer Syrian, they are no longer Muslim in that sense, they are no longer Iraqi, even they are no longer Afghan. So the problem is now collapsing orders in the region are creating a large group of people who are losing their capacity to reconnect them to their culture. I mean, imagine if what happened if I bring a Taiwanese kid nine years old to a camp in Latin America and spending five years. We don't know who is he. I mean, I'm not a critical of camps. They are very critical, important, but the success of camps have some limits. limits. I have a very funny story. I had the opportunity of visiting a camp in uh, southeastern Turkey. 
And I noticed there were two guys quarreling with each other. One is a Turkish official, the other is UN UI. The debate is very interesting, very detailed, but it is telling. The Turkish officials are distributing already cooked meal. Okay, ready. Just people are eating. The UN guy is saying that you shouldn't do that. Because there are so many girls, small kids, and there is no way that we should teach them learning Syrian culture if we if we distribute already cooked meal, they cannot learn how to cook in Syrian way. So the only mechanism, try do something that Syrian ladies keep cooking in the camp. That is the way how can they transmit their knowledge of how to be a Syrian lady to small kids. So all these fluctuations create serious problems in terms of bringing culture to one generation <coughs> to another generation. Why I'm telling this story? Because we have generations and generations who fail to bring the culture to other generations. For example, Iraq, a source of ISIS radicalism, later I will focus on. We have a generation in Iraq raised in an environment without no national symbol, common symbol, no national flag. Iraqi national flag is not saying to many Iraqi people. Even the Iraqi president is meaningless for some Iraqi people. No national football team or dance club, for example. I mean, Football is not popular in, in here, but I'm sure there is, for example, uh, baseball is popular. It, it unites people. People like to sit here. For example, I visited a very prestigious university. A prestigious professor told me that, you know, there's a guy who was born in Taiwan playing in an American baseball team. So even academics are proud of such things. So imagine how, you know, millions of people are proud of this kind of stuff. So the, the point is, uh, the, 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 the collapse of order in many Middle Eastern countries, also in African countries, creating a new generation and generation of people who are out of their cultural context. And this is a sociological explanation to analyze the rise of radicalism. The second point is Western attitude. <coughs> a couple of years ago, American prestigious magazine, Foreign Policy, very famous one, information one, published an article by a leading American scholar, Stephen Walt. The title was, Why Do They Hate Us? It's an article written for Americans. Why, why Muslims I mean, are critical of the West. Uh, Professor Holt, at the time working in Princeton, OEA, I'm not sure right now, uh, counted the number of Muslims killed in wars in the last 10 years. And the article has a conclusion that, according to minimum standards, in the war that U.S. involved, quarter million Muslims were killed. As a big number. And just imagine if you, you you have the number of quarter million people killed in wars, there are another quarter million left, another quarter million neighbors, another quarter million sons, so and so forth. So the group of people who are directly and negatively affected by these wars may create an anti Western reaction. I'm not an anti Western person, but as a scholar, we should understand the dynamics that. Uh, foster, that does foster, that does enhance this feeling among Muslims. Part of that, in other <coughs> cases, Taiwan is a very tolerant society. I mean, as I said, I stayed just two days, but it is something you feel. You feel it. I mean, while speaking to academia, to the journalists, the people going to mosque, automatically you feel that. I, I, I did not try it, but I got the impression you can stop your car and pray as a Muslim and nobody is going to care about it. It's good. You should protect that. Because it may disappear suddenly. When in the late 90s, as a graduate student, I live in Amsterdam in 1999. Our Dutch professors at that time were proud of repeating Amsterdam is the city of tolerance. It was. Still it is. But with many differences right now, less than 20 years, the rise of uh, right, right politics is now changing the tolerant dynamics of Amsterdam. I'm telling this story because it is teaching for Taipei. You are a very tolerant society, but if you don't care about that, it may disappear very quickly. There are so many cities around the globe, one's city of tolerance. For example, do you plan to go to Baghdad for a vacation? No, of course. But a couple of centuries ago, Baghdad was the city of tolerance. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was the professor of philosophy and had some Christian students from Spain. So things may change quickly. But the problem is, 
this is interesting to analyze Muslims in Western societies. I mean, it is not nowadays easy for Muslims to live non among non-Muslim societies. In France, for example, or in other countries, for example, Muslims have some demands, you know, to teach Quran to their students, to their, to, to their people, to their kids, or headscarf issue, for instance. So one reason to explain this tension is some Muslim, some non-Muslim societies unfortunately are not tolerant enough to offer basic rights that they demand to Muslims. Uh, and also, unfortunately or fortunately, even we should understand why some Western societies are doing this because they are also under the influence of very strong and negative media image. Before final analysis and what I can suggest in terms of personal contribution, one thing is here, sometimes civilizations go to a crisis. If you go to 1920s, 30s, if you count the persons who got Nobel Prizes in chemistry, <coughs> in mathematics, even Germany, but less than five years Germany has become the uh, center of fascism, or Italy, Mussolini, or uh, Spain, Franco, or uh, what happened in Bosnia Herzegovina in the middle of Europe in 1990s. So what I'm saying is not it is normal, but unfortunately, for some reasons, maybe human nature, it is, it is a pattern we should be aware of that. In the same way, today, if I may say, Muslims are going through a kind of civilizational crisis. As a Muslim, I should confess it, we are now in a kind of civilizational crisis. Which means that there are big debates among Muslims, intra-Islamic debates. The debate is Islam and democracy. Islam and women. For example, some Muslim countries uh, do not allow women to drive. As a Muslim, it doesn't. It, it, it's not Islamic to me. It is shame. But it's. The, I mean, I'm just giving some samples to show that there are grand debates among Muslims. How to interpret Islam? How to interpret international politics from the Islamic perspective? What Islam tell about market economy? What Islam tell about poverty? What is the Islamic message to, to Muslims in terms of, for example, personal freedom, liberty, for example? Uh, so, just happened sometimes in Europe, for example, in the early 1600s, the Muslim societies are going through, going through a kind of civilizational crisis, if I may say. Which means that Islam and rationality, Islam and freedom, so and so, Islam and environment, for example, very ironically, I don't want to give the names of some countries, <laughs> maybe some of them are very close to uh, Taiwan, some countries who used to be known for their Islamic tendencies end up as corrupted governments. So this is a philosophical problem, how it happens. Normally Islam asks people uh, from followers to be very harsh on corruption. It's, it's very, very corruption. In Islam, Collected responsibilities have a dominance over personal responsibility. So if a governor uh, makes a kind of corruption link mistakes, it is something the last thing you should do because the tra traditional text says that then you're gonna go to hell. But there's a there's a problem of practice. So while analyzing before the the crisis, these problems of extremism and radicalism, you should realize that there is a kind of Crisis within, when I say Islam, not the Islamic theory, but among Muslims. Muslims are now trying to overcome these inner problems uh, corruption, Islam democracy, Islam studies of women, individual rights. Very frankly speaking, 10 days ago, International Institute published its corruption index. The leading countries are Muslim countries. This is something Muslims should first realize and should be self-critical about that. So, in explaining radicalism, on the one hand, okay, we have a right to criticize the rest as Muslims. It is the US who contribute to state collapse in Iran. Okay? But on the other hand, Muslims should be self-critical. Why we have these problems? I mean, uh, why a small country like Taiwan, with 20 population, 20 million people, have the great economy, just a comparison, for example, Turkish population is 80 million, but Turkey's export is less than half of Taiwan's export. 
So this is telling to us there is something wrong in our kitchen. We should make a kind of reform. This is extremely critical because the global community have responsibility from that perspective. The intra-Islamic intra debate in the Muslim world is critical for other people, including those living in your country. How? First, non-Muslim uh, people should be in a strong dialogue with the Muslims who interpret Islam in a peaceable way. I, I, I wouldn't employ the term moderate, because you, you don't need to be, say, a moderate Taiwanese, Chinese. I mean, a, a normal, a typical Muslim should be moderate. A typical Muslim or Christian should be moderate. So we don't need to use this kind of level, a moderate Christian. <coughs> okay. But what I say is there are some Muslims who interpret Islam in my reading, which is uh, parallel to the original interpretation of tolerant Islam. So the first thing that I want to emphasize here is international community should be part of this dialogue because for two reasons. First, larger Muslim community who are unhappy about also radicalism, but the radicals are marketing their ideas to those, look the West, look India, look China. They don't understand Islam. So we shouldn't make them to market the idea. Very frankly speaking, more than 95% of Muslims are very unhappy about these radicals. I read all the public surveys in Turkey. 97% of Turkish people, 97, believe that ISIS is a terrorist. There is no doubt. It, it cannot be normal. Such a, such a brutal culture cannot be. You cannot imagine a culture to naturalize such a brutal organization acting in that way. But the problem is, it is time to keep the dialogue with the larger global community and those people who interpret Islam in a peaceful way. We are having serious difficulty. I mean, speaking from the Islamic world, those, I cannot speak on behalf of them, but those who want to interpret, who want to continue Islam, interpretations of the peaceful way, have a serious difficulty in finding potential friends out of the globe. Out of the globe. Mm -hmm. It is very, very big. The second problem is, part of that, uh, today in, in northern Syria and Iraq, we have this ISIS problem. It is, a, it is called, unfortunately, is, uh, they, they, they call it as Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Levant, or Sham, or Damascus. But of course, it's not, it is neither state nor Islamic. The, the chief American, one of the greatest American uh, analysts, Brzezinski, two months ago, appeared on CNN TV and said that it is not Islamic no state. It's not Islamic. It's not Islamic. I mean, you uh, it, I mean it's not correct, but it's, it's unfortunately labeled as that. The second point is not a state. I mean, it's a kind of group of actors abusing the power gap in northern Syria because in Syria there's a civil war. Two million people left Syria just for Turkey. It's the total number of people. As Syrians left the country is, is far more than 2 million, and there is no government, there is a civil war. In Syria, part of the civil war, at least 200,000 people were killed. It's such a catastrophic situation. So having such an opportunity of gap, they are, they are using it. So it's not a state as well. The second point is, we shouldn't exaggerate it. I mean, uh, it, it, it doesn't have the sociological capacity to become normalcy of the region. It is a kind of, uh, cell, which is a pathological cell, which came out in the region because there is no one to control it. Because all other groups are also weakened in the region, part of the state collapse, the Arab separate in the region. But we have alternatives. I did talk about my experience <coughs> in North Afghanistan. Uh, there is a funny story. I was the school in Afghanistan. Uh, a group of Taliban came to school and asked, are, are you using computer? Because in their understanding, using computer is not uh, recent. Recent means that not correct according to religion. Then the guy won't want to say those people. Because normally, if you have some normal guys, you can explain the computer using it because it's very normal. Then there was a, a sharp guy who thought that, OK, look. And they pushed the CD, and computer started reciting Quran. Then the guy OK, well, I'm convinced. It's, it's reading Quran. So we are laughing, but it is, it is the product of 50 years of war. People with no education. I mean, 
just be the cycle. So the, the way to convince the Taliban guy, and the school was a Turkish school. The, the funny thing, in a country where even people normally do not allow the girls to the street, there was a school teaching uh, offering education to girls. The, the, there was, we have this school part of Piramidun. So this is extremely critical because part of global community, well, when we look at the, 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 the globe, we have ISIS-like organizations, we have authoritarian guys, and we have some guys who support the idea of tolerance. So it is our global responsibility to support those guys. There is no other way. I mean, if you wanna, if you want to stop that, but because this, you shouldn't. I mean, it, this Taiwan is an island. Okay, but to be ISIS radical, really, you shouldn't do that. I mean, uh, even your short history is for many wars. The second Great or the first war that happened in mainland, you know, Japan, so on and so forth. I think the this part of the globe is more experienced than many other parts of the globe to know how things could become globally threatening. So it is one response, it is one <coughs> global responsibility to support Muslims, those who are trying to offer education to girls in Afghanistan. Are we doing this? But there are some people doing that. So this is a kind of global responsibility. Three days, weeks ago, I was in Calcutta, India. Uh, and I decided to buy something as a gift to my family. I, but, but I was hungry and I, I went to Subway. There was Subway in India everywhere, just like US. Subway is by the way good. It's cheap and very fresh. I noticed three guys from Australia. And one of them was a kind of sick for some reasons. I asked them who are they said that we are part of a church from Australia, but spending our holiday in India to help orphans. This is a typical, perfect sample of global responsibility. So as a scholar, I admire them. Okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a scholar, but those guys, maybe they are in the age of my students, but spending their holidays in such a different place, <coughs> for a typical young person who live in Australia, spending some time in India requires a kind of cultural adaptation, so-called cultural adaptation. So this is typical, this is the way that, I mean, after all theories, so, being part of these dialogue organizations, supporting these kind of people in need through international connections are the only way. I mean, humanity is facing serious problems and we cannot find out quick solutions. Part of that, the final thing, we have a need individual. Everywhere, I'm, 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 I'm <coughs> rolling by. The, the need individual is something like that. Okay, I do care about my my life standards, spending vocation in Spain, economic stability. So if the governments ask those people, shall we do something for Syria, I don't care about that. This new individual is becoming, unfortunately, normal stereotype even in Western Europe. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a European public opinion putting pressure on the governments to be active in human rights in a world. It disappeared. The governments, even in Western Europe, cannot persuade their people to invest other societies problem. So in that sense, this individual is killing international relations, split of international relations. It's a very uh, dramatic development. So I, I think uh, this is a way, unfortunately, I don't, uh, I don't uh, wish for that, but may even open the door for a kind of another you know, global instability. So the school in Northern Afghanistan in a society of 40 years of war, that offering education even to girls is the moment. Uh, and the, 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 the point that I can raise to the global community, and of course part of that, the people in this country is, when you, as a Muslim, when I look at Taiwan society, I should realize that there are some people who are caring of tolerance, democracy, and global friendship. That is the way that I should be in contact with them. And in the same way, vice versa, the people in Taiwan, when you look at the Muslim society, if you are unhappy with ISIS, if you are unhappy with uh, you know, extremism, the simple and the logical way is to help those people among Muslims who care about dialogue, tolerance, to be in contact with other religions, Buddhists, I don't know, Christians, so and so forth, even atheists. Uh, I shouldn't say even, even 